for the last three weeks, um, because of what it is that I do, a lot of people have been asking me, what is this? How am I supposed to make sense of it? Um, when it first happened, um, it was obvious that we had all seen a slow motion public lynching, some for the first time. Um, <clears throat> and the reaction in the streets was a protest um, uh, of people who were tired. They were exhausted, not just from staying inside um, from the novel coronavirus, but they were exhausted from the names, the accumulation of the names like Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor and obviously George Floyd. Um, in Minneapolis, it had been, you know, Jamar Clark and Philando Castile and Blevin. Um, but as the, the days went on um, and the protests spread from Minneapolis to New York, to Tallahassee, to Texas, to Idaho, to Alaska, to Berlin, people realized that this was not just about policing, or at least it felt bigger than that. I remember talking to an activist in the first week um, of the events. Um, I was worried about him because activists get targeted um, uh, by law enforcement, by employers. And so I asked him, are you going to go back out? And in his response, saying he felt like he had to, he said, the, the pain I feel is too big to fit in my body. And without thinking, I responded, I said, that's because the pain that we're feeling is too big to fit in a, to a lifetime. This is generations worth of agony. The way I've described it before and today and tomorrow will be, it's, it's, we're seeing the past due notice for the unpaid debts owed to black communities for 400 plus years. And the urgency of now is the interest that's accumulated on top of that. And it's important to understand that as the central element of what we're seeing, because if we imagine that the problem is just policing, then we're gonna have solutions that are way too small. Even if we fixed all of policing, imagining that was possible without dealing with everything else, uh, then we'd be stuck with a small chunk of what people really need and paying this debt over and over and over again. So for this audience, to a group of, of data scientists, right? Those of us who work every day in Python and in R and in Stata, um, uh, if we labor in Excel sheets, it can feel as if our work is so far removed from the vital lived realities of what's happening every day. Um, we can manage that by taking to the streets with protesters, making signs, donating to our, our our causes, but when we get back to the work in the day, it can leave your mouth feeling tasteless, right? <clears throat> and uh, I'm happy to say that when you understand the part of the problem, the biggest part of the problem, the way to frame the problem is that we ha haven't had an honest accounting of all that we've done, all the, the targeted abuse and the benign neglect of Black communities. Counting problems are problems that data nerds and justice nerds that we're actually exactly equipped for. So publicly, part of what I talk about is the need to strap in, the need to get yourself emotionally prepared for the moment when the cameras turn away. We're coming really close, right? I've started to see that the top of the news shows are about campaigns or about the COVID numbers, all very important, but they've ceased to be about the protests if the protests are even better organized, bigger, but less violent. So it's time now to start strapping in and saying, I'm not going to allow myself to be less activated about this moment just because I'm not seeing it on my screens every day. But for this audience, for y'all, there's more that you can do. You can take on small projects in your neighborhood, in your city, in your county, in your state. You can take on the job of saying, all right, so how many people aren't just having force used on them, how many people end up in the hospital? How many times do police have contact with kids in my neighborhood, in my city? If the data aren't public, you can ask. And if they say no, you can FOIA it because the data belong to the people. You can do these bits of accounting that other people can't, that the country hasn't. I can't overstate how important it is to just do those measurements. Um, I know that when I was growing up, uh, my parents measured everything. Well, not everything, but they measured my height. Um, they measured you know, my grades. 
they measured, they literally talked about how many friends I had and as a proportion of the people I could be friends with in my grade. My parents were nerds. Um, uh, but it also was one of the ways that they cared. It's one of the ways that everybody cares. If you grew up in a family that struggled with money, you know that when you go to the grocery store, you're counting in your head every dollar and every cent. Um, if you grew up uh, in places where you, you had money, probably the budget was a really important thing for your parents. And for everybody who is part of and runs a business, you're paying attention to the things that the company you work for or that you run values most. How on earth can you live in a world where the things you care about, you don't bother to measure, right? Even love, we pay attention to the amount of time that we get, the kind of attention that we get. All the things we care about, we measure. I cannot overstate how painful it is that we've neglected to measure the terror that the state does in the most vulnerable communities in the United States. How would it feel if the people who have the power to measure every little move that you make online, every little dollar that you make in every little way, didn't bother to measure the number of times that their agent sent you to the hospital and sent your neighbors to the morgue. So unlike what I say publicly, you all can do more than just get emotionally prepared to strap in because there will be another George Floyd and the cameras will not catch it. And the story will be very different from law enforcement than what happened. And we will have no way of knowing, but we can start the process of having an honest accounting and you all can help. And if you're looking for more ways, you can log on to our website, right? Policingequity.org, but you all are creative. I want you to be thinking about ways we haven't thought of yet, ways that we can't because we're dealing with the tsunami of, of unprocessed data from law enforcement. And I don't just want this to be a law enforcement problem. So that's the first thing I want to make sure that you all knew. But the second thing I want to be talking about is how we move forward in addition to that honest accounting. Once we have any kind of sense of how big or how many or how long, there are lots of calls right now to be doing things that are radically unimaginable to a lot of the country three weeks ago. I'm talking mostly about the calls for defunding the police, right? which may sound kind of, of uh, bananas, especially um, in context where you think about, well, what happens when I, I'm having my house broken into? What happens when someone is committing a, a violent felony? Right? Surely the police there. And first, it's important to know defund the police means many different things to many people. Um, there's one extreme of it, which is literally full abolition. There's no law enforcement anymore. The community can handle it themselves. But what I hear most from Black communities, what polling says Black communities are more interested in, like what activists tell me when I'm sitting in meetings with them, is that we have had generations of defunding Black communities. So look at the history of mental health hospitals in California. Right? We had mental health hospitals. We had public hospitals for folks who were mentally ill. They were difficult. It is not a success story of public investment. Um, there was abuse, there was neglect, there was a lack of regulation. But what happens when you close them down is you give them a set of antipsychotic drugs. You say, I hope you're able to take these when you're supposed to. You have no home. Sometimes your families are scared to bring you in. And instead of having public accommodations, we have law enforcement. <laughs> we have public education, which used to be part of the way in which the country created so much wealth. But increasingly, we've pulled back from investments in public education. We've taken that out, we've defunded public education, we've allowed it to become privatized, right? Which is why charter schools end up being such a big deal. Right? I'm not gonna delve into that debate, um, <clears throat> but the idea is that why is it that those who are most vulnerable can't have the things that privatization is supposed to offer? Lots of reasons for it and debates to be had, not my thing, at least not today. But the point is you wouldn't have to do that. We wouldn't be having that debate if we had invested in public education. We've taken that out. The ACLU estimates that there's 14 million kids going to school right now in schools that have police officers, but no nurses, no counselors, no psychologists, no therapists. And in places where I've worked in the Midwest and in the South, you oftentimes have to drive an hour or more to get to a grocery store that has fresh vegetables. So we've defunded public education, we've defunded public health, we've defunded substance abuse, we've defunded mental health. And the only public good 
that we put any money into in many of the most vulnerable communities, poor white communities, and especially urban black communities, is the police. That's why in some communities, you're more likely to get taken to the hospital in the back of a black and white squad car than you are in an ambulance. So in those conversations, in those communities, what they're talking about when they say defund the police is if we're going to keep defunding black communities, at least allow black communities to decide where the little money gets poured in there goes. That we can take money out of law enforcement and we can put it into having 911 be able to dial social workers and marriage counselors and school psychologists and public health advocates. <clears throat> the idea is that safe communities public safety begins with this notion that it'd be best if we didn't have to call the cops. And if we give communities the resources that allow them to do that, then we're giving them the, the resources, not just to defund the police, but to determine their own destiny. So it's not for me to tell protesters what their slogans should be, but I hope that people take that invest in black communities is the thing that everybody agrees on in this. That regardless of what you mean by defund the police, invest in black folks, that's the thing. Because everybody wants folks to be in positions where they don't have to call police in the first place. <clears throat> so I want to point out two things about what that looks like. One is that if you're going to take money out of law enforcement or just invest in black communities, it turns out you can't just throw money at the problem. You shouldn't just drop it from a helicopter, have folks fight over it, and then say the problem is done. You got to invest smartly. There's a lot of programs right now that have a ton of money, but they're regulated such that the most in need don't know how to get access to it. Data nerds can help. This is why justice nerds exist. Figure out how to set up the regulations so people can access the money and the resources that they need. Figure out what you can be investing in that has the greatest return on investment. You can't do that by feel. You should listen to black communities for sure. They will give you the best lead to begin with. But even the folks who are living on the ground can't tell you the proportion that needs to go in one service versus the other. That's going to need analytics. That's going to need us. The other thing that I want to point out is that even if you cut law enforcement, let's say by 50%, let's say you cut the personnel of your local law enforcement by 50%, what on earth is the guarantee that law enforcement that's left is going to be just the good ones? <clears throat> that by slashing the budget, you've gotten rid of all the bad ones. And if they're there and they have fewer officers, which means they have less capacity, they're going to be stretched thinner. That's a recipe for disaster. So we can't just cut based on a feel that it needs to be smaller. We need to cut smart in the same way that we invest smart. So who are the officers that should be sticking around? I can tell you if you cut randomly or you just cut based on budget, almost every union contract I've ever, I mean, everyone I've ever seen, and I'm sure almost everyone in the country says the last hired or the first fired, which means the most junior officers who are most progressive and are most capable of engaging in culture change are the first out the door, unless you, you figure out a different, smarter way to do it. And in the same way, whenever city budgets get cut, the after school programs, the ability to, to have law enforcement be able to take care of, help clean up the park, take care of the elderly, those are the first ones to go. Those are exactly the ones that folks who are calling for defunding law enforcement don't want to see gone. So if we're gonna cut programs and we're gonna cut personnel, we better do that smart. And it's gonna take a lot more nerds that are currently employed in law enforcement. Here's what I mean by that. There's roughly 18,000 law enforcement agencies across the United States, give or take a couple, right? <clears throat> of those 18,000, 75% of them are 25 officers or fewer, and a thousand police departments are just one dude. It's always a dude. They don't have an IT department, right? They don't have a data system that keeps track of things. They've got, if they're lucky, Old Willie. Old Willie mostly works in the basement full of mildew with a bunch of cardboard boxes that have manila folders in it that are stained with ink fingerprints, nothing digital. Um, it's in the basement where it floods about once every 18 months. Um, and so mostly those pages are stuck together and are growing black mold. If you wanted to do a fun natural language processing pro uh, project, what you could be doing is helping old Willie transfer all of those files for the last hundred plus years into something digital that would give us an archive to let us understand what's happening in the small departments. Because you're twice as likely to get shot and killed by law enforcement in a small department than you are in an urban department. 
Makes sense. Urban departments have more training, right? They're, they've got better standards they're able to use. <clears throat> so small departments need our help deeply. They need the help. Um, but it's also important to get that of the 18,000 law enforcement agencies across the U.S., not one of them has the exact same data system. And I shouldn't say data system because they've got at least three. Almost every department has what's called a CAD system. That's the 911 dispatch system. They've got a records management system for what comes in. And they've got an IA system, an internal affairs system. Now, sometimes use of force is captured in the CAD system, sometimes in the RMS, sometimes in IA. And those systems, you'll be shocked to hear, don't speak to each other. It's part of the reason why the Center for Police and Equity exists is to start integrating those systems, auditing, cleaning, standardizing them so they can even be compared across systems. I'll tell you that process is difficult. And another fun project for anybody who's listening to this to take on is helping your local law enforcement break into the late 1800s in terms of data collection and capture, right? Because I'll tell you, we've worked in departments that have tried to digitize their data and the location information that they captured on a series of incidents just was the word cheese. I assume somebody was taking a lunch order and just wrote it down in the wrong place. But I'll tell you, when you're trying to get longitudinal and latitude data, uh, longitude latitude data for that, it just gives you the state of Wisconsin, which is not useful. There are all of these things that are going to be necessary for reimagining how we do public safety and for giving back to the most vulnerable communities the power to determine what safety is like for them. And we're not going to get there just from the people who know how to write laws. We're not going to get there just from the people who know how to pass budgets. We're not even going to get there from the people who are experts in civil rights, community empowerment, and law enforcement. We're going to need nerds to make sure this happens responsibly. And I've been talking about all the things I can't overstate. I can't overstate this either. If we fail to do that, if the nerds don't show up or we're not called in or we don't do our jobs right, here's what's going to happen. Minneapolis that has announced it's going to take a year-long process to figure out how to disband their department, they're going to have a rise in crime. That rise in crime is going to be accompanied by a couple of really high-profile homicides or sexual assaults or both. And politicians are going to take those stories and they're going to tell mildly genuine stories of horror at all the awful things this terrible moment has led to. And we're going to see a backlash of the kind that we saw in the 70s and 80s and culminating in the 90s that led to the largest rise of mass incarceration in the history of our species. History moves in ebbs and flows. Civil rights movement was followed by incredibly regressive politics um, and a retrenchment of restrictions on, on civil rights, particularly on black communities. If you're not a student of history, you may not know that immediately after emancipation was a period known by historians as the reconstruction. It is still to this day, the height of black representation in elected office. We gave out money, tracts of land, gave out a bit of recompense for the hundreds of years of slavery, but still the majority of time that this country has been a country by this name. And that reconstruction period was followed by what we understand by historians as the nadir. The stripping of all of those protections, the stripping of rights, the institution of poll taxes, and then the code we now understand as Jim and Jane Crow. We're at a moment in history where real progress can be made where it's possible to imagine a really different world because the virus that has been stalking our species for the last several months is forcing us to think about a different kind of, of, of way. It turns out, right, that what's behind me in your eyes isn't really here. The whole world is different. And Zoom meetings are the norm and are likely to, to stay with us for a while. Working from home is a real thing. Kids and pets uh, uh, interceding on our, our business meetings. All of that is with us for some time in the future. We're already actively imagining a different world and we can be doing the same thing on equity as we're doing that on public health. We have to. And people by the millions in the streets are calling for it. But if the nerds fail to show up in the way that we need to, this period of promise of imagining a new world beyond being forced to stay in your house 
is going to be met with the kind of scapegoating that also can come from these moments. And I am not sure which path we're going to be able to choose. But I do definitely know that nerds, data nerds, justice nerds, we're going to play a big role. And so now is the time to start getting ready for whatever role you want to and can play to step up and to strap in. Because the role we're going to play, as is often the case, is not all that sexy. I'm sorry, folks. Learn to live with it. It's not sexy. And it's not going to be in the front of the cameras. It's not going to be at the front of the movement. But without it, failure is absolutely guaranteed. And the things that we all feel like we might be able to grasp for the first time, maybe in our lifetimes, for the first time, maybe in the history of the country, we're going to be responsible for putting that firmly within reach. We're making another 50 to 100 years before we can touch it again. So with this moment being as big as it is, I implore all of you, strap in, take up your pet projects, do more than the people around you who are feeling like they don't know how to tap in and they don't know how to contribute. Figure out a, a way to turn your data nerd status into justice nerd status, and not just with our merchandise. Make it part of your life. We can do that now where we couldn't before.